welcome to the new webinar series from Community Finance Ireland, supporting GA clubs on and off the pitch. Just to let everyone know that this event is being recorded. And if people are tuning in and you're wondering what this is all about, it's a series of virtual conversations with some of the most passionate GA clubs across Ireland. Over the next few weeks or so, um, or over the last few weeks, should I say, we've been hearing from GA clubs and local heroes all over the country on the challenges they are facing, how they're investing in their future through social finance, and about passing the baton on to the next generation of change makers in their communities. So, so far, it's been a really exciting and informative series. And just to introduce myself as well, my name is Ashton O'Reilly. I am delighted to be hosting the webinar series. I'm a full-time sports reporter with Off the Ball, which involves a mix of presenting live from studio in Dublin and then going out broadcasting live from games and interviewing players and managers in all sports, really, but mainly GA, rugby and football. Personally, then, I would be passionate about sport as a fan and as a player. I play for a Rateau GA club in County Mead. And I've been involved with my club there for over 20 years now. It's been a massive part of my life. I've definitely seen the growth in the club since when I started to now and how we've really improved the facilities. And that's had a massive effect on the success within the club. I do currently live up north in County Down. So I'm up and down the road constantly to still play with my own club because I couldn't make that transfer. Uh, not yet anyway. So I'm up and down the road and um, thankfully Drumgat GA here in County Down, they were kind enough to let me become a member and train with them and also then still play with my own club. So that's been a, a massive advantage that I've had here in County Down. And as all of us know, how important and incredible GA clubs can be in those situations. Also then, let me introduce to you then our three panellists for tonight. We have Patrick Barrett, Chairperson of Ballantubber GA. How are you, Patrick? Thank you, Ashley. Good. Tom Nocton as well, Club Coaching Officer with Sir McKee DGA. How are you, Tom? Good, no, thanks, Kirsten. Good, good to have you here. And then Anne Graham, Client Relationship Manager for Community Finance Ireland in Connacht and Donegal. How's it going, Anne? Hi, Ashley. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks to all of our audience as well for joining us. We'd like to get you involved as much as possible. So please don't be shy and get involved. You can post your comments and questions for the panel through the Q&A function actually here on Zoom or on Twitter using the hashtag supporting GA. And I'm going to get to those questions through, throughout the discussion as well. So I might just start by um, chatting to Ollie, just a little bit about your role that you have within the club um, and a little bit about yourself as well. Tom, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, um, so I'm a coaching officer in CLG Corvacagia. We're based in kind of west or kind of southwest Mayo, um, and we're a small rural club with, uh, you know, population of the local areas. We're uh, about maybe 1,500 people. Um, we have, I suppose, football for boys and girls and men and women in the, in the main. And I go, my coaching officer role probably encompasses, I suppose, getting managers at the start of the year, trying to get upskill coaches during the year, maybe just trying to, Talk to coaches on a kind of weekly basis to see how their 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 team is going. So trying to get little little bits of insights into what they're thinking and just giving them a bit of a steer here and there. But in the main, just trying to keep this ship afloat. I do a bit of coaching myself with that with the, with the under sixes and, and fives, so I'm kind of busy with that as well. But just generally, kind of with the smooth run of the coaching side is my my main my main job. Brilliant. And Patrick, do you want to tell me a little bit about your role? Uh, yeah, Ashley, um, I suppose uh, I'm chairman of the, the club, I uh, have various roles, I suppose, in it, uh, with the day-to-day -day running off the club and I suppose with the teams and and making sure, or trying to make sure that everything is, is up and running. Uh, I'm originally from Belmullet, uh, further north in Mayo, and uh, I moved here to Ballantyre around 2007 when my son got involved with the club. Um, so I might be as uh, up to date with the history of Bellator as Tom would be with Tom McCady, but uh, I'm, I'm getting the, the hang of things. I'd say you're very busy being the chairman. You've had many different roles. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's like having a second job, I think, at times. Uh, but it's it's very enjoyable, uh, I must have it. Um, it's great to be involved with the, with the community and, and the people within it. 
would you like to tell me as well a little bit about your role within Community Finance Ireland? And you're also involved as well um, with dropping kids off to GA matches, I'm sure. Uh, both, both are full-time positions. Uh, yeah, my name is Anne Graham. I'm the Client Relationship Manager with um, Community Finance Ireland since April last year. Um, really enjoying this role. I've uh, worked in finance for a long number of years, more years than I care to share on here. Um, um, working with a lot of sports clubs, especially GA clubs in that whole region. Um, really enjoying it. Um, in terms of, I suppose, being involved with GA, my, both my children are uh, players with Bonkrana GA. Um, it's a fairly decent size um, club with excellent facilities, great uh, executive committee there. Um, and I've got nothing but admiration for anybody that's on a committee. Um, I help out where I can. Um, and that is, I suppose, my background. I've never actually played GA. Um, it probably wasn't a thing so much when I was growing up, uh, but it certainly is a thing now, which is great to see. You've probably seen that change over the years from then to now and the, the difference in participation, I suppose, especially within women in sport. Yeah, it, it, that change has been mammoth. Um, like I don't even recall G even mentioned when I was growing up, um, which is only one generation ago. Um, whereas now um, I have a daughter and she's heavily involved in sport, um, soccer and Gaelic. Um, but just the amount of opportunities that are coming with that, the social life that comes with that, that network that they have. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to see. And I think there's a lot of work done there, you know, with women in sport, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, we've got some great role models here in the GA. Um, for women especially and men um, but there, there definitely is more work to do and it needs more funding it needs more support at government level and within the GA um, but um, yeah th th there's lots of positives there um, and there's lots of room for everybody in a club I say you know just because you're not a player doesn't mean you don't have a place there's, there's always there's always a role for everyone absolutely of course and we might start then with uh, passing the button on so what does that mean so basically the need to, to foster the next generation of members and players as custodians of the club who are going to continue to build and sustain it then as that valuable community hope. Tom, as a, a club coaching officer, part of your role then would be to forge the links with the local primary schools and promote the underage activities. How can clubs foster interest and involvement from the younger generation, whether it's playing or getting involved off the pitch? Yeah, yeah. Um... I suppose if I go back a bit, like I, I was before I was coaching officer, I it was the kind of schools development officer. We had probably three or four schools at the time locally, but that merged into two primary schools locally. And I haven't really lost that job. So I'm coaching officer, still the job that I had previously, which is not fine. I was happy to take it on. And it was it was just really liaison with the two schools, with what coaching went on to the schools. Our, our, our main connections would be like Partry and Tromagidi are two half parishes. So we want to connect them. They're in or under our, our kind of uh, region for picking our players. So they're within our boundaries. So we're trying to make sure that the, the kids are interacting as much as possible. So we kind of organized like little training days where the schools would, would mix in together. So there wouldn't be one versus the other. The kids would come over and they'd, they'd have training sessions and that we'd mix the teams up, boys and girls, and just get them a connection with each other. So some of them would already know each other. But there would be a few on the on the kind of the periphery that would be undecided: will I join a GA club or not? And we're just trying to reach into that market as much as anything. Um, we kind of at the time, but pre-COVID, now we, we maybe 2014, we designed a T-shirt, a black T-shirt, with our both our, our schools. There's a big lake called Mask between the two schools, and it's kind of part of Mayo. That's kind of synonymous with our club. Um, and we put a map of the lake and the mountains and the two schools and the th actually the time all the schools were listed on, on, on the map so we give every child just a, a little memento of, of, the, of a t-shirt like again it wasn't an O'Neill's t-shirt but it was quite a decent a decent t-shirt for the child to go home with so them little things were initiatives just to try and I suppose give them a connection with the club make them feel like they're all part of the one parish all part of the one umbrella of the club and that was that was an important thing COVID kind of interrupted that a bit but Again, now in two, two Wednesdays' time, is, I think it's on the 22nd, we've been fixed again for our, our, another day for this year. Uh, we have coaches going in from the club. We have ex-players helping out with coming amongst skill teams. But like, it's, it's always a challenge to get the person. You need to get the right person that understands you know, the children and can work with children. So it's, it's, a, it's a valuable thing. On a, on a different kind of note, to kind of connect with the language and the, the chanka that we have as a club so, so I suppose it's, it, it is a, an identity that we have that the clubs don't have 
and we connect with other Gaelic clubs in Mayo. I think Pat, you're from Belmont, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so Pat would have this understanding too. So they have a, a deeper connection because of the language. And we, we, we seen something last year coming out of COVID. We wanted to organize something for the young kids, the, the eight, nine-year-olds and the 14-year-olds. We organized a blitz that connected with the Mayo Gaeltox and the Galway Gaeltox, which we'd be kind of dead center nearly to them all. So the Connemara clubs at underage and the, the, the Mayo clubs, we joined. It's like, I'm not sure you have a concept of the Comortus Pell. Have you heard this Comortus Pell on the Gaeltox? That, it was it's a con it was on over the weekend now, but we had a mini underage one. Have been Dingle this year in the Comortus Pell up there in the Podio Shay. That's a different one now. That's kind of okay. more of a yeah, that, that, this, this one's organized by Co Park. This one the, this, this, there was one on in Galway over this weekend gone. Okay, so we organized like a one day version of a, 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 a Comortus Pell for the mm -hmm. children. So language was hugely important. We also had some shame stuck some activities that were going on as well. We had say music and we had dancing and they were learning traditional uh, instruments. So we had more going on just in Gaelic. So as you said, reaching out to more than just uh, the footballers. But in the main, the football was the, a huge draw. And we felt just based on the language, the importance of the language for us, to, to the kids connect. It's a real living thing for us. Uh, and we, I suppose it's, it's, it's powerful, like in its own way, when you're speaking a language, that the opposition team aren't speaking and you have them few words, it, you know, it empowers the kids and empowers ourselves. And I think um, we've really driven on, I think, since 2017. We, we actually hosted a Comortus Pell here ourselves as a club in 2017. And that has kind of really moved us forward as a community, uh, both sides of Parfum from Acadia, just to kind of buy in, we upgrade our facilities, again, for the young kids, thinking that we want our kids to have what every other kid has in Mayo. And now we have facilities that would, that would match any club in, in Ireland, it's, it's really, you know, it's helping, it's helping get the kids to buy in and say, look, this club is really pushing on and, and it's easier now just to, to motivate people. So that, that's a few of the things we've done, actually. And do you think because you are an Irish speaking club that you have that little bit of an advantage and I suppose the uniqueness to you is to give you that even more of a bond? I, I think so. I don't know. It probably re in some ways might sound a bit maybe romantic, but it kind of reaches into your soul a bit when you speak Irish. You feel you feel a bit more of a Gael speaking Irish. I think it's 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 something you feel more than something that you see. You know, you feel it as a person. Um, and that's that connects with the other we're we're forging relationships with all the other clubs in that are similar to ourselves. And a lot of them get the clubs in Galway anime or they're quite rural as well. And you're you're getting little bits of feedback from them what works for them. Um, I, I think it's powerful. And you know we would we wouldn't drop it like for anything. It's 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 really really helping us. It's it's like I would really go back to 2017 where our facilities would have been quite modest. But since that, the community has really forged together. And I would even think since 2014, 13, when the whole thing came up, as the idea was formed for that. You know, we really pushed on in terms of community spirit, and I suppose community finance helped us a lot in our build. Uh, you know, we were building our indoor hall and sports facilities. We we got a, a big big. Um, Bit of support from Unity Finance Ireland, which kept us kind of moving. We had a bit of a, a I suppose, a cash flow issue at a point, and they came in and we needed you no know, support, and we got we got the project over the line. And since that, I would say we pushed on more. We have more ideas. We have an astro on the agenda for 2023. So it's 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 not just one off thing. We're 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 pushing forward all, as much as we can, and it's 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 very progressive, which is it's not nice and positive. It's it's, it's bringing our membership up. It's making people. Want to join the club, which is which is what we want. Okay, you're continuing to grow all the time, and I'm just thinking you must have an advantage on the sideline when you're playing against teams that don't fully understand, and you can be shouting anything on, and they wouldn't know what you're saying tactics no, wise. <laughs> no, it's 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 lovely when you do that. It's lovely when you do that. It's just it's it's just uh, yeah, it's it's, it's 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 one of the things that no one else can do. You can do it, and it's, it's yes, it's good. Brilliant. And then just in terms of field and teams, then Patrick, have you ever had? Was any issues or difficulties in fielding teams, or have you always had um, a strong number of people within the catchment area? Um, I suppose we've had difficulties in the past fielding teams, but um, we've always managed to go maybe touching the side or or maybe bring uh, underage players up from the that would be strong enough to play at the next level up to uh, to, to be able to field the team. So it's never really been a massive issue then. You, like having two teams now is such a, a I suppose, a, a positive thing and you can see the growth. Yeah, it is. And, and I think it's the first time in a number of years we've managed to be able to do that. 
at uh, 100 13s and 14s this year, but we mm -hmm. have two, two teams and uh, it's great that we have the numbers available. Brilliant. And, and you've been out meeting the people involved in the GA clubs. What are the main challenges you've come across that clubs may be facing? Okay, um, um, the guys there have just touched on some of them and, you know, the the geography, I suppose, of some clubs, because maybe of their rural uh, position can, you know, create challenges in terms of, um, you know, creating, I suppose, uh, or attracting enough volunteers and committees to help run the club. Um, the guys both touched on it there too. It, it's, you know, organisation of clubs is huge and the book goes on in the back room and trying to, you know, timetable training for all ages and groups and timetable matches. Um, so facilities sometimes would be, you know, scarce on the ground. Um, I would see that as a big challenge and obviously Community Finance Ireland can step in there and help. Um, I suppose the, the main and obvious one is always money. Um, getting the right funding, um, you know, mix together. Um, and if there's a borrowing need there, you know, obviously, yeah, we can help with it. Um, what I would see as well is probably, maybe not so much in the last couple of years, but prior to that, um, probably fundraising would probably have been a challenge. I suppose during COVID, um, you know, some GA clubs I've witnessed have come up with really novel ideas of drumming up innovative fundraising and there was a wee bit more cash around then. I could probably foresee that as probably being a challenge going forward and um, just, you know, in terms of kind of the sentiment that's around with um, recession maybe looming and, you know, a bit of this inflation, that could, could be a challenge. Um, and I think uh, probably um, succession planning is a sort of a challenge for some GA clubs that I'm coming across. You know, they want to plan ahead. There is, I suppose you know, people that are involved for clubs for years and years and you need to plan and, and let those people go and step away and maybe, you know, just enjoy it as being a member. But they're so embedded and so valuable to each club that it's hard to let them go. Um, so those would be, I suppose, the main challenges um, that I would be coming across just uh, from dealing with the clubs on a day to day basis. I suppose, yeah, workload in the background is huge um, and it's not, you know, it's not always just about money workload organization um, and keeping volunteers and committees on board is equally as probably challenging as the funding issue. I'd say that the main thing then probably out of all those things you mentioned is having then a strong committee in order to, you know, put all of this in place and to get the fundraising going, putting on the events, to have people that are maybe stronger in other areas, if it's finance or uh, the PRO or all of these things. So Tom, is that been an area that's uh, very important within your club that you have a strong committee? Oh, yeah. I like just come back to my, my kind of 2014, that kind of starting point or 13. We, you know, we had a, a female chairperson called Patty, Patty Egan Stanton, and she, you know, got a great committee around her. Uh, and they were just the backbone of that original development. It was like, wasn't just three people either but there was three or four at the, at the, maybe at the top table but there was a huge following after that then that were on the ground and as you said like everyone eventually not even eventually fairly soon understood where they had a strength it might be with the language it might be with the engineering sense side of it it might be with the coaching and we just kind of all took to our, our jobs and got and got, got moving and could see that you know it garnered momentum like we had a couple of fundraisers which really local initiatives where we, we fundraised ourselves and that was, you know, a huge kind of buzz around the areas at the time. Like, you know, you've heard of these kind of white collar boxing nights and this kind of stuff. But that really was 2014, 2013. And I know other clubs have done it, but it started something inside of us to kind of say there's a project looming here. And we just had to get, you know, that was driven by committee members, both male and female, just good people who have great skills and could get and put energy into the into the jobs that was needed. And like it was a daunting enough challenge for us. You know, we we had a very modest, you'd say kind of, you know, one story building with just two, two dress rooms. It was quite basic and was built in the, in, in the 80s. And the purpose of it at the time was perfect. It was very modern at the time, but it had run its course. So we had to kind of change a bit. And our, 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 our costs in the end, our, our facilities now would be up on 1.5 million, 1.8 million. It'd be, you know, I would be, it'd be a huge, a huge undertaking for any committee. So we kind of got through all that step by step and it wasn't in one in one six months or it was it took a couple of years to kind of get that all moving but that took people took good people it took good people 
having good relationships and just building uh, all the time and reaching out. People weren't looking to take everything on either. It was just good delegation, good organization, mm-hmm. good leadership, which is brilliant. And we're, we have changed chair, chairperson since that. And while that, we've got a, a different person in charge now, we've got a fellow called Joe Heenhan, and he's doing a really good job. And he has, you know, a lot of good people around him as well. And it's it's it's, it's really positive. We have a female secretary called Kathy Welsh doing a really good job as well. And they're just they're 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 easy to work with, good good people. And it's just valuable for us at the minute, you know, really valuable. And we need to kind of, I suppose. You know, keep this 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 momentum going as long as we can, and see where it takes us. And then, Patrick, for you, then, is it key to delegate? You are the chairman, so it, it's it's you that has to, I suppose, delegate and make sure that everybody is is working together and things are happening. Yeah, and like as Tom said, it's great to have a good group of people around you. Like I've Sean McHugh, our treasurer, and, and this Conway, our secretary, uh, who are two brilliant people and put in an awful lot of, of work. But then you have the executive outside of that. Uh, and then outside of that, then you have the volunteers, the, the, the people who cut the pitches, market, you know, clean the, the, the dressing rooms. There's so much going on in a club now. And uh, to make sure that it's running, you know, I suppose relatively well, it takes everyone to be pulling the same way. And of course, everyone have, has different views on the way things should be done. But in reality, everyone just wants the best for the club. Uh, and it's just, I suppose, trying to bring everyone together and, and moving the, the club forward as a whole. Uh, and I suppose remembering that the most important thing is the players and the sport and the community in general. And, and having, I mean, like, just for example, working with Joe McKay, and Tom mentioned there when they had the uh, coming, uh, the Gamortas. Um, yeah, they, they used one of our pitches that time, and and you know, that's the whole thing about the GA. I know we have our rivalries and everything else, but you know, you, you always see the spirit of the GA when when another club needs something, or if there's someone from another club sick or whatever, the whole body of the GA comes together, and I think that's what's very important about the whole the whole GA as a you know in general. Uh, it's 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 about the community really you know we can have all have um, like thankfully we're just after upgrading our own dressing rooms here in Clamour uh, and and they're, they're brilliant they look great and all that but at the end of the day it's all about the kids the, the, the footballers the players and, and getting the, the most enjoyment for everyone and when you updated those facilities Patrick did you immediately see the benefit then for all of the, of the kids and the players Sorry, Ashley. When you updated those facilities, did you immediately see the the benefit for the kids and the players? Um, I would well, I wouldn't necessarily. I suppose we sort of really came to the fore around twenty ten when we won our first senior county title, um, and we've won five since then. So with that that success, it, it helped us, I suppose, enhance the facilities and more young people wanting to get involved and of course you have the other club in, in our parish family who have to have their own excess success with the um, county college and national league our national championship titles like uh, all Ireland titles which was huge as well for the young girls in the in the, the community so i suppose it all blended into um, the success of both teams being able to develop the both facilities we have. Brilliant, and I'm sure as well something that would be a benefit and is having all ages and generations involved in a club. Yeah, it is. And, and as Tom touched on there, we have ourselves have uh, ex-players, you know, coming into coach and possibly with their own their own kids' age groups and that. But not only that, we have a lot of a lot of our senior players are helping out with coaching and development as well. So when young people see um, these players who have won county titles and played in, in Connacht finals and whatever, coming down to train with them or coach them, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge feeling for them young young people to see. And I think we, we sort of lose touch of uh, how big it is for the younger kids. You know, I, I meet the lads day in, day out, and. I just know them as the lads, but when you're 
seven or eight, and you've got someone who has five county medals coming down to help you coach or train or whatever, it's huge for them. I, I think we underestimate it. Yeah, it's powerful. Just getting back to your, your, your question, Ashley, I, I, I would find since we upgraded our facilities, like the, the, it's, it's used all year round now. It's used from January to, to December. We have weekend people going down there on their own stream using the gym, using the footpath. We have a footpath now designed around as well for as street lights. We're, we're including now family members. We wouldn't have member, you know, you have people maybe that are in their pension ages and you people that might have young families and they might be started playing yet, but you're you're attracting all the ages in between to the place, uh, which helps to spread the net, it spreads the good news of the facilities. And we're all proud of us and we're trying to keep it as good as we can and, and keeping it as clean and up, up keep on it. You know, it, it is taking work, but you know, the kids are proud proud of their, their facilities. They, they they probably don't know different now, some of the younger ones that they've seen it now for five years. But we all can the fellows that are a bit older would know know that I was put into all that. So we have to always remind them that it is important that we have pictures of the of the old building on the wall and when they're old enough they'll be seeing the picture see well it's, it's been like this and it's gone out to this we have to maintain it like you have you have your own responsibilities to keep it as well uh but i just think they, they're, they're they've great pride now in going down they've great pride in, in just using facilities you can see there's a bounce in them and you know before we had these facilities we didn't have a place to go in the winter time you know the kids didn't have an avenue to kind of do exercise or do a little bit extra training whereas now you have your it's a cultural thing now you see teenage boys and girls going to the gym going down with a bottle of water on their own steam it's, it's like society has, has driven that not even ga it's and it's we have that option they don't have to go to town now or go into uh go into a castle bar or westport i'm sure you're, you're the same path you have it on your doorstep you've some, some, something very similar yeah it's a really good thing to have the facilities just there you know there's no question mark can we go or will we go but we have it here we, we don't excuse yeah, uh, and I think I think uh, when we talk about the GA in general, you know, it's always about football or hurling or whatever. But as you, you touched on there, the walk with facilities now, there's so many people out walking now, and to have safe facilities for them, especially in winter time, you know, to get people off the road, and, and it's great for rural communities to be able to have that facility. Uh, and it, like as you said, I think um, young people are more in tune with their own health and fitness and it is important to have as you said somewhere for them to go really in winter time as well and not be you know i think if you're involved with a club of any kind whether it be gaelic or soccer it keeps the mind active and and you know when it's when your mind is active you're not getting involved in maybe things that you possibly shouldn't be getting involved in you know yeah. and it's very important for rural communities to have these facilities there that that they can allow the older generation and younger generations to uh, access you know these facilities and and, and keep them active in, in the especially winter months that's exactly it it's much more of a community hub now than anything you know when you talk about those walkways that it's something for everyone you, you don't just need to be on the pitch you know it's uh, about getting everybody in the community involved and, and when you're out meeting these clubs, is that something that a lot of clubs are, are quite passionate about, including having these walkways, having these play parks, that sort of thing involved in their club? Yeah, absolutely. You took the words out of my mouth. It's no longer a, a Gaelic club. It's a community hub is, is what I'm seeing. And it's great to see it because there is something for everyone. And it really does, I suppose, drum up buy-in and promote buy-in from all levels of the community. Um, and just something that Tom mentioned there just about the teenagers now, it is really, it's, it's much cooler now to be at the gym. Uh, I, I can see that with my own kids and that's really um, heartening to see and it's, it's very cool to be fit. Um, and it's definitely a culture thing. I think it's, I think it's fantastic um, to see it. Um, but yeah, just a lot of them that I would see have availed of different funding packages and they're putting their walkways around with their lighting. And it's, a, it's really important, I think, for rural communities, because I live rurally, to have somewhere where it's safe to walk, um, you know, with the flood lighting. Um, because like we all know of too many cases where, you know, walking on by, you know, by roads, country roads, it's just not safe. But th that's just a fantastic thing. And I think GA can, can build on that as well. There's probably more that can be done um, in terms of, you know, br bringing more sort of community facilities. But uh, we're getting there and it's um, impressive stuff, really impressive. Yeah, it's absolutely great to see. And then, Tom, how do younger generations then learn about the nuts and bolts of running a club and keeping the lights on? Yeah, that probably is a challenge because 
I know even teaching kids now, you know, to, for them to kind of, they probably think you're like you know, from outer space telling the things you would tell them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, it doesn't register with them for, for some reason. It's a challenge. I think what they need to do and what we're doing here is we have transition years that come to our coaching sessions um, and they kind of see what goes into the coaching. Um, but they're young and you, 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 you can kind of sense from them you know, they, they're, they're taking a bit from it, but they're probably still in their teenage heads as well. I, I think it's a challenge for us. You know, we, we have to just try and maybe just talk to them more when they're at the point where they can, I think, take it in. Um, I think it, that's one thing we've done. We've kind of, they've, they've came to the coaching sessions and mirrored it. But still, I think we have to work on it. As, that, that part of it is it probably, it's something that's that's going to be needed because they're they're, they're, they're going to hold the batons that we're holding now. They're going to hold the, 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 the team manager's positions and the, and the chairperson's positions. I think over time, they'll realise, especially if you're a parent and your child is with you, they'll understand how it was important to my dad or my mom, you know, or my uncle or my cousin. You know, maybe I need to kind of think about well, why was it important to them? Am I like that? Do I think it's important to me? Uh, you, you, and, and then you need to think outside that too because you need to have changed the mix and get more people involved, which which it is a challenge, Ash. Like I think in a small community, it's a challenge. You won't have the, you know, the, the pool of resources or the pool of maybe expertise that you might have in a town. Um, what's really helped us locally in the last uh, four years or five years is five families have relocated back to Stormacady and Partry, and they all had three or four kids, and they're they're bolstering our underage at the minute. But not that them five families, but they've really added to the underage. Getting as Pat said, the thirteen player. Or 14 players or 15 players so we've we need more of that we, we need to promote our, our, our locality as a place this is a really good place to live you know clean living sports important the language is important the schools are important the language all that stuff we're trying to promote and th they're, the, they're the, the things that outside of the football our community needs to build uh the football club is central probably to most conversations i would say but um yeah we, we need to build build across a lot of things but I think it's it's the, the, young, the youth will follow in their own time I think you can't enforce it you know what I mean yeah I think as you get older it registers like I would have seen my family involved and I wouldn't have thought about getting involved I was too busy concentrating on playing and then as you get older you see okay now it's becoming my turn to step in here to you know help with the underage teams or you know join the fundraising committee so I, I do think as you get older you start to, to realize more and more that okay and you want to get involved you know it's it's in no way a chore to do it it's you know it's your time and you feel like you want to get involved Patrick would you have I suppose many younger members involved in the committee at all uh, yeah we would have um, our uh, Irish language officer and our um, player liaison officer would be in 22 both of them um, so yeah I, I think it's, it is very important that um, that we, we do try and, as you said, pass the baton on and, and people start getting involved at a young age because I think an awful lot of uh, families are very clued in to what it takes to run the club, but then you have other families who, who mightn't see the level of work that goes in, you know, to making sure that the pitches are put or the pitches are marked or, or and all this for match days. Um, but just something that Tom touched on there with, in relation to families going back, I think uh, our politicians and especially our local councils are very, maybe need to loosen the rope a little bit on plan of mission and, and getting people back into rural communities because there seems to be an awful lot of hoops to, to jump through for a lot of people, especially if you're not from the area. Um, it, it's very hard to... to uh, move out to the country and, and some people just prefer bringing their, their kids up in the country and I think that if we don't do that our rural areas are going to you know become increasingly more decimated with you know you, you have pubs closed and you have uh, people having to emigrate due to work and everything else and I think we're lucky here to a certain extent both ourselves and, and Tom's club Tommy Kitty with the Two big towns of Westport and Casabar having a big employment um, for the, the people in the area. But I, as, as Tommy, you know, it hits on there. I think getting people back into the community and, and being able to live here is is hugely important for the for the survival of clubs and, and communities. Oh, of course. And would you have seen a lot of people emigrate, Patrick? 
Yes, we have, but yeah. Now, I suppose in the last number of years, we've been sort of reasonably lucky. Um, we wouldn't have had a, probably a, a, a big an immigration as, say, my, my home club, Rock in North Mayo. I know there's another club down there in, in North Mayo uh, who sort of, you know, it's well known they had to pull out of the championship last year due to being able to not be able to feed the team. Um, and I think that with the two towns we have here, we're sort of very lucky, and, and that's that side of it that you know we have. And of course, I suppose everyone was given out about COVID, but an awful lot of people have realised now that you can work from home as well. And and with the rollout of fibre broadband across the country, I think that helps an awful lot of people maybe move back into the area as well. You know, you don't have to work in Dublin; you can work remotely and maybe travel once or twice a, a, a week. So they're all very positive things that I suppose that one of the few positive things that, that did come out of COVID. Can I just come in there? We, 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 we actually have discussed about, you know, the numbers is kind of in our heads a lot with 13 and getting 12 or 13 players. And Pat, you mentioned it. It's your, it's your, you're lucky with your you have two teams now, which is, you know, a brilliant, a brilliant opportunity to get all them boys playing. You're going to be competitive. We, we kind of discussed it last year as a club. We actually had bits of meetings with the county board about, you know, our status in terms of trying to continue to feel as a club, but numbers, you know, are, are quite low. Now we're, we're fine to a point, but, you know, we, we would like to be, you know, pushing a bit more if we could. So I kind of discussed with at the meeting about maybe offering to, to certain clubs that might have a numbers deficit, like ourselves, and I'm sure there's more, uh, that you could offer out maybe an age cap of an extra six months to the club. That say, say we were playing against a team that had no issues with numbers, that they had they played under 12, but we couldn't play under 12 and a half. That you get an extra six months in the cap, but that would take a bit of regulating from the county board. Now, they, they didn't say no, they didn't say yes, they were kind of you know open minded, it was an idea, but it, it would take a bit of regulating. I'm sure Pat would agree, it wouldn't be an easy, an easy kind of one to who's eligible for this, but it, it would you know it would give us an extra three players to get to the 13th person. Um, things are, are that tight for us. Like we, even with 13, we'd be playing a couple of guys below the age, they'd be playing age below as well. So if we're playing under 12s, we could have four or five, nine or 10 year olds playing. So we're trying to just get a bit of parity there uh, in the future. So that was just an idea. That was an idea yeah. just to kind of, to kind of, like a... I, I like coaching school. I coach it in mm -hmm. St. Gerald's and Castle Bar. We, we, we have an age group there at junior, which is under 16 and a half. So it is done at college's level. Again, a different, I know, different set of rules and everything. So it isn't that it isn't done, it is done. Uh, but, uh, but the club, one club playing under 12, another one playing under 12 and a half, for example. Yeah, you'd have to just get the lawmakers to kind of be on top of things there. Uh, sorry. Would all, clubs be, would all clubs then play the, the 12 and a half? Or I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think that'd be fair because that, that would give them an advantage back then. Because they get more players again. Yeah. You're, okay. You, you want to just maybe single out who the clubs are with, with, with the numbers deficit. Give them yeah. give them the kind of the credit to say, well, you can go, you know, give them the, the allowance to go 12 and a half. Um, again, you could say then, well, every other, every age group might be deficit. But, you know, it's, it's, it's one way around it without having to, to amalgamate or concede that you don't want a team. You know, it's, it's, it's a route around the problem. Um, which it was just it was something that came up. No, that, that definitely sounds like an avenue that people should go down because I can only imagine in rural clubs how difficult it could be at times when you see a lot of the you know lads hitting or women as well when they hit college age and they're moving away for college and they're getting jobs and they're going to the cities and then they're not playing so you, you're always you know losing players. It, it must be quite difficult, Patrick. Yeah, and and I suppose. It's only re as recent as uh, four years ago, we amalgamated with another club, Park Kilos Grimlin, uh, at minor level because um, we just didn't have, we probably would have got enough if we had dropped down to our under 16s and, and picked some of the strongest ones there. But of course, you're looking at player welfare, like an awful lot of these young men are, are playing with their schools, they're playing at their own age level, they might have soccer, they might have rugby, and you know, you don't really want to throw them in then at, at another higher age group as well. Um, so we amalgamated with Park at the time and it was relatively successful. 
I suppose the, the biggest issue there is you need to make sure that you have management from both clubs to, to get a fair um a fair you know dispora of, of the of the players that are involved and, and make sure that everyone's getting game time and that but I think we have some very similar problems as to what Tom has has with the, his own club now in the past. And as I said, it's just this is the first year at under 13, 14 that we've actually been able to field uh, two teams with the help of, of our under 12, stronger under 12s. That's great to hear, absolutely. And then um, we might touch on fundraising then for clubs. It's it's one of the, the main activities um, for clubs in order to, to bring in funds. What is the, the main, I suppose, most popular maybe forms of social finance then for clubs firstly, and then we might touch on the fundraising. Okay, so the most popular form of social finance with ourselves is probably bridging loans. Um, and then the second would probably be term loans. So your bridging loan would typically be put in place to help the likes of the clubs to maybe facilitate a drawdown of a sports capital grant. Uh, sometimes the clubs can get leader funding as well, which is usually your county council funding. And then uh, what we do is we provide term loans then to assist with funding gaps. So say, for example, there's a capital spend of maybe, say, 150, uh, 150,000 and the club's getting maybe 100 just for round figures from sports capital. Sometimes the club will have the 50,000 already fundraised if they're planning ahead. Sometimes they might have some of it. Sometimes they might have none of it. And sometimes what happens as well is uh, you know clubs might get more sports capital than they thought or less and it's usually where, where the less comes in that they have a funding gap and that's where they can come to us and um, they can get the bridging loan to help them draw down the grant funds and then we'll provide the term loan then to, to bridge that gap um, and sometimes they're getting no grants at all and they're they're going and, and borrowing the funds maybe to you know buy additional land to, to put more pitches on and because a lot of the grant bodies don't give funds for that so that's I suppose typically what we will do and I suppose just to kind of clarify we will look at you know two facilities at any, at any given time there's a sort of a myth there that sometimes if you've got a bridge loan you can't come to us for a term loan to bridge the gap for match funding that's not the case we will look at both at the same time um, you mentioned fundraising there fundraising is, is a huge part of let's say income and expenditure accounts when I'm looking at a loan or assessing it and often the fundraising will be the main source of income and the membership income, especially for smaller clubs, will be the smaller amount of income. But something I suppose to note for any club that, that want to talk to us, we will uh, take fundraising into account, um, especially if there's a strong track record of it. And that's not something that would happen in mainstream banks or, you know, maybe um, other lenders. Um, they just you know, they would dismiss that maybe as being you know, not reliable or unsustainable, but we will take that into account. So that's something, you know, to bear in mind. Um, just in terms of, I suppose, um, you know, the figures of uh, lending that CFI have done and to put it into context, we, um, from 2016 to 2021, and both both these sports clubs that we're talking to tonight, Terma Keady and Ballantubber are included in these figures. Um, we've supported 73 GA clients throughout um, the whole island of Ireland um, and just to say that we are an all-Ireland lender um, we have um, presence in Northern Ireland as well um, and just in terms of what we've lent here in, in Republic of Ireland it's just over five million um, to the likes of the GEA um, and 62 percent um, of our clients um, are based um, in ROI and our average loan is 53 and a half thousand. So that's the average loan. Um, so I suppose that just gives some context to the kind of stuff that we're, we're doing here on the ground. Um, I suppose if anybody has any questions or anything like that, maybe at the end, if they want to talk a wee bit more about finance or what's involved, we, we can expand on that. Um, yeah, please do um, send your questions in and we can get them to Anne. I think there's a few coming in, so we definitely will get to them soon. And Tom, for you then, when you work for Community Finance Ireland, what were the benefits, I suppose, that you'd seen? Well, just going back to that issue, like I wasn't um, coaching officer at the time, but I know we came through this Camorra Dispel and the Gilfield, which I mentioned, which is a huge, big deal for these rural places in Ireland. They all come to a village on a weekend. You're talking five, 6,000 people coming to us. We have to facilitate for matches, male and female matches. It's like, for us, it was like a mini Olympics. So we were building for three or four years for this, 
Um, the build was taking its time. I suppose we probably ran into just a few cost issues with maybe we hadn't the cash flow to pay out for certain materials. And Community Finance Ireland came in, like gave us a bit of a step up or support that we needed and really kind of helped us to get the build complete by that weekend. And it was huge, a huge, a huge um, support to us. We couldn't be but just impressed with how they dealt with us. So I think uh, we, we without them, we weren't going to make it or we were going to have definitely a bit of pressure on us. So we, we, we felt that they relieved that pressure when, when we seek that support. Um, and like since that, I've just said to you, that, that has kind of spawned a kind of a sense of what we can do a lot more in our club. So that little kind of support gave us the, the knee up to get to that weekend, to get it finished, to get our, our facilities to a great standard. And now we've pushed on as a club a lot since that. So it hasn't just helped the money part, it's helped support just that when we, we when we got that weekend finished, we kind of were empowered, I think, to do more, and that's evident as as even today now with these machines down there, but getting work done. That we have an outside handball court going upside the GA pitch, uh, an Astro to come later on. So we also are going handball in the club. So it's it's definitely all of the things are, are coming from support we got pre that Camorra Spella. More members now as well. If you're upgrading your facilities again and again, like as you said with the the handball court, that's that's brilliant to hear. And Patrick, for you working with Community Finance Ireland, what was the I suppose the benefits and what did you get done in your club? Uh, at the moment, the, the building I'm in at the moment, our new dressing rooms and uh, upstairs function room, that was a huge boost to us. And and like the the finance that we got received from from Community Finance. It, it enabled us, like that injection of large cash helped, as Tom said, get us over the line and so many other things. Because we have our weekly lotto and we have uh, other smaller fundraisers throughout the year, which help us to, to, to pay back these loans. But when you need a large sum of, of cash, you know, you need someone like, like themselves to, that they can help you out and get you over that hurdle uh, and, and get you moving. And that was hugely important to us. And like, like that, we have a, we're hoping to upgrade our lighting now in the our other pitch over in Ballant Tower and uh, our walkway lighting as well. To, you know, because I suppose nowadays energy costs are so huge, and, and, and that you have to be looking at LED lighting and sensors and making sure lights aren't on at times that there's no one around. So that's that's what will be our next step, and, and like we'll be we'll be talking to, to them to, to get us. Up. You know, get us that uh, lift up to get us on the road to uh, draw down the sports capital. Some of the messages that often came in uh, throughout this series to me, even separate to these webinars, was how do we even just get in touch? Uh, how does it all begin? How do how do we start a conversation with Community Finance Ireland? You might um tell us a little bit about how people go about that. On okay, so there's a number of ways they can get in touch with us. Um. Uh, the first would be, I suppose, you know, th they can phone our head office in RD and place an inquiry there. Um, they can also phone me directly because I'm the client relationship manager and we can probably share, you know, the numbers maybe after to the attendees. And then probably the simplest thing, because everything is so much online now, you can place an inquiry through our website at the apply now uh, function that's at the right hand side. Um, and that is there's two options there you can actually apply for a full loan if that's what you are sure that you want to do or if you just want to have the chat place the inquiry there that triggers an email to come to me and then a phone call from me directly to the you know the club um, whoever that representative is and I'll talk you through the options I suppose one of the ideals I suppose in dealing with Community Finance Ireland is it's not just financial advice that you're getting often and you touched on something earlier about fundraising often we will share you know, tidbits or, you know, best practice that we have seen other clubs picking up um, and proven to be really successful, just in terms of bigger capital projects um, and things that really worked for them. So you're not just getting financial advice, you're getting a sort of a helping hand to hold you through that whole process. So I suppose that's to answer that question. Um, just something, um, I suppose, that, that um, Pat and Tom mentioned earlier, um, and just, in, uh, you know, when it comes to applying for a loan, it can be daunting applying for a loan and there's that fear of what if they say no and you know invariably cfi will say yes and if it's if it's not a yes we will explain why you know if, if it's not just right at that particular time but when we did say yes to term mckitty and any other clubs i can see it every day on the ground where it inspires them 
and, and builds confidence in, in their club. Once they see that they're getting that support, it's like, well, you know, there's somebody out there that actually believes in what we're doing. Um, they can see the benefit. They can see the social impact, you know, especially things like addressing rural decline and things like that. Um, and, and what someone said to me recently was, which I thought was really interesting, they have a loan that's coming to an end, but they want another loan now to create momentum again within the club. To, to go to that next stage of development um, because they believe that if that loan dies off, it could be a case of where momentum might just kind of, you know, deteriorate a bit, that enthusiasm that they get. And, and you know, um, Tom touched on it there. It's, it's that kind of when people see the new facilities, when people see, oh, you know, there's something happening down there. There's something for everybody. It does create buy-in and it creates interest and it, it, it just, I suppose, drums up support. So, you know, I suppose it's important to kind of you know stress that when someone from an outside body supports you it definitely instills confidence and self-belief to, to move on to that next stage or consider phase two of what maybe you originally shelved a couple of years ago um but um yeah it's um that part of the job I find actually really rewarding it's it's you know when you're ringing up a club saying yeah we're going to support you we're going to give you that loan it's, you can almost hear the, the sigh of relief and what I would say to any club or anyone that's listening you know attending here tonight it's never too early to speak to the likes of Community Finance Ireland you know you might be tossing around a few ideas at club level thinking could we do it would we get support I'm not too sure is that something they would support Pl place the inquiry drop an email to me <clears throat> you know just say you know I just we're thinking about this what would you think is it something you would support because that allows us to advise you in advance and say look this is what you should do, X, Y, and Z, get your ducks in order. Um, so it's never, ever too early because then we can all plan ahead and collaborate together and get, get the right package together for the club. It's definitely something that I found and from doing these series and meeting all of the Community Finance Ireland team is that you all get it, like you're all involved yourself. So you get what it's like to, to run a club and the difficulties that it, it has. So it must be refreshing, I'm sure, for the likes of Tom and Patrick to, to meet and chat with you and say, look, this is the situation. And you're like, yeah, I, I understand that. So that's yeah. great to hear. And um, fundraising was something we mentioned, but I actually I never really got into it. What are some of the fundraising ideas, Tom, you would have in, in your club in Termakiti? Well, the ones that we've done in the past would have been, uh, we've done the Strictly Come Dancing, which garnered... 60k I think at the time wow um and we've done a white collar boxing and they were like I think they were like maybe a year apart maybe a year and a half apart this is now building to this 2017 end game for us like it was that was we had to get a lot of money in pre-27 so that was 2014 2015 we've done them and then we've done like even textiles recycling we've done backpacking we've done pallet drives we I think we sold livestock in, in a march I think it was with we had huge kind of support from our immigrants abroad in, in Chicago and the UK and term parts of the world that they all kind of said we, we can see a massive project the plans and the the physical change were coming to the place and you could see the stories were being told on Facebook and online and people were saying as you said and um, we want to be part of that there's something really positive happening there so that was like that garnered massive support yeah. um and I really have to kind of just thank like we are, at the time, we had a, a chairperson uh, called Patty Egan, and we did treasurer called David Lally and Michael Lang was secretary. They they really were driving a lot of that big ideas. Like a lot of people probably in the past would have felt maybe this is too much for for a community like Drummondy, but they had a big vision and they they got support and they were just brilliant. And David was a local engineer on the job, and he's you know he had a great vision for what the, the complex should look like, and it has came to fruition. It's it's, it's eye catching when you walk in. Or even drive into the village now. It's like oh, you can, you can. It's, it stands out like you want to be part of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is huge. But the fundraising brought, brought support, Ashton. It brought people together outside the GA club as well. I'm sure Pat agree. You're bringing in other people who aren't necessarily on the ground on the pitch, but they, they want to, they want to get involved with boxing, or they want to box, or they want to dance, and it's you know, that's that's great buzz as, as well. And getting people involved and you know having that camaraderie between you all as you said if even if they're not involved in in any of the playing aspect of things and Patrick do you have some fundraising ideas I'm sure everybody's trying to come up with new fresh ideas and it, it's difficult to keep doing that each year what is your probably main fundraising um activity 
I suppose our, our, our main one of it is our weekly lotto, which uh, I suppose when COVID hit, we were debating whether we'd be able to run it con you know, continuously because the pubs are closed down after this. And myself and the former chairman, Tony O'Connor, uh, we just decided we we're going to run it every second week in our home and have it live on Facebook. So our online lotto uh, increased significantly uh, with players and that. And, and I suppose that's really our bread and butter every week. That's what keeps um, the bills, you know, at bay. Um, now, also during that time, we had we had we raffled a car, uh, a brand new Peugeot, um, and and that generated huge interest all over the place. Uh, I think we we pulled about forty eight k for that one. Uh, also had similar to um, to Drumagating with the, with the. Uh, the celebrity come dancing and that. But I think yeah, like you just have to keep imagining new ways and and people seeing that they're you know that they're their odds of getting something back for what they're 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 spending as well as the, those people of course especially outside the club but the people within the club you know they just give generally in here because they want to be part of, of what you're doing and, and when when they see new facilities and, and things like that going in, uh, as Tom and Anne, hit, you know, hit on there. They want to be part of it, you know, and, and it's more so, I'd say, people overseas. I think that, you know, they, they have a greater bond with, with the homeland, possibly, than the people just living down the road. We're actually considering, um, I just seen us, I was at the meeting, there was a meeting, a committee meeting on Monday, and on the minutes of it, mentioned about potential for a teenage disco as a, as a fundraiser and even to kind of run with that like we had one there at the Faroga Rand the local Faroga club in our facility and it probably again was the starting point of an idea that you could have a few of these you probably need a bit of manpower you know helping out but you know it's it, it's, it's quite manageable you'd make you know a couple of hundred I would imagine but it still would, would pay certain bills for certain things it wouldn't be the big ones but you know them little couple of hundreds here and there you know they're, they're valuable as well small fundraisers too and um, some of those local discos like are, are some of the best memories that the kids will have as well like even we had one in our local GA club and we all still talk about it and how other clubs used to come in and well, that's how we met them all and got friends with them all and then we were playing against them on the pitch so you know it's about those memories as well too and we do have some questions as well I might just get to one or two so the first one was with two very demanding roles in their clubs, how do both Patrick and Tom prevent themselves from burning out? Patrick, I'll come to you first as, as chairman. How do you prevent yourself from burning out with all the roles you have? Alcohol. <laughs> oh my God, anything else? <laughs> uh, no, I tell you, I, I, I'm sort of, I am very lucky in the sense that my, my youngest is, is doing her leaving sort of the moment. So I, I don't, have the, the, the journeys of, of bringing them everywhere and, and anywhere. And um, I work in days, so I suppose, I suppose the enjoyment of it all uh, helps you as well. And when you get things done or finished and you see people enjoying what you, you've done, I think that gives you a huge, a huge kick. But I know Joe plays at alcohol, but uh, the, the also the, the social aspect of the GEA, you know, meeting people, meeting other teams. When you go away to play other teams locally, you know, meeting other people after the match for a drink or cup of tea or whatever. Uh, it's just the social aspect of it is, is hugely important as well. And I think when you can fire off uh, maybe different problems you might have in your own club to someone from another club, they might have had that problem. And, you know, you, you get new fresh ideas from them. Yeah. And for you, Tom, just before we finish up, how do you prevent it? Um, I, I look, sometimes you just need a day or two off and you kind of just come back in and you have be refreshed. You just need to step away from the WhatsApp for a while or step away from the from the train and the teams. Can you just one second, I'll close the door. <laughs> we nearly got there. We're just coming right to the end. <laughs> the kids are in. So training's I would think yeah, <laughs> just, the training just, must be finished at home. <laughs> training's finished, yeah. But they're, they're, they'll, 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 they'll last a few more minutes. I, I, I just even a bit of training myself, you know, it has to be switched off. But again, just I think stepping back for a day or two. Like I don't have the demanding role that the chairperson has. I, I, I'm quite 
you know, light in terms of having to get all that pressure that's on the chairperson and the secretary. It's, it's easier for me to kind of, to not carry that burden. I know it's Pat's role, is, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough gig. Like you're, you have to be on, available to answer questions uh, a lot of the time. So I don't, I don't, I don't envy that position. Um, but if someone that's like Pat and our own club, Joe, they're doing great jobs, you know, it's, it's, they deserve massive credit. Oh, of course, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, that is all we have time for this evening. I hope you have all enjoyed it and found it informative. The next discussion is going to take place later in the summer. And as always, you can register for the events and find out more how social finance could support your club at communityfinanceireland.com. A massive thank you to our panellists, Patrick Barrett, the chairperson of Ballantubber GA, Tom Neachtan, club coaching officer with Termakidi GA, and Anne Graham, client relationship manager with Community Finance Ireland for Connacht and Donegal. And also thank you to the Community Finance Ireland team, and most importantly to all of the attendees for joining us this evening. We'll be back again soon. Good night. <laughs>